right, all right. Welcome TLC. Welcome you guys to their church. It's good to see you guys. Happy New Year. Happy New Year 2019. I haven't preached for you guys in about what, two, three weeks? Two, three weeks? Man, I'm excited. I am excited. I have been like, I've been backed up with with the word. I'm ready to let it go. So uh, I'm I'm uh I'm here today. We're we're actually in a new series, right? It's a series called Game Changers. Game changers, game changers. We have, man, this coming year, we sat down with our leadership, we talked out with people, and we're like, hey, TLC 2019, we have a vision to be game changers in this community. We actually want to be game changers, okay? And not only do we have that vision for us, we, want, we have that vision, we understand that in order to have that vision for a church, we got to have that same vision for the people individually. And so let me, let me, let me share with you guys, let me ask you this question. What do Henry Ford, Thomas Edison, Hamilton, Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg have in common? Innovators, Innovators, right? They are game changers. (laughs) They're game changers. Man, they are the people who, they raise the stakes, right? Whatever, Whatever they thought was the standard, that this is how it should be done, they change the trajectory of everyone else around them, okay? They are the people that elevated the game. They are the people that change the very way in which we see reality, okay? And so this is, this is the, the, the hope and the vision that I pray that God will have for you 2019. I pray that God will give us this vision for 2019 to be people that elevates the game. People that actually changes the trajectory of everyone else around them. People who actually raise the stakes. Okay, God has given my heart a vision for 2019. I'm going to share with you guys later what 2019 looks like for, for TLC. But can I tell you something, right? This is how I know it's from the Lord. Because the moment God kind of just revealed it to me slowly, it, it, it brought in my heart the one thing that my emotional response always has when I think of things I cannot deal with, right? Worry, right? If you guys didn't know, like my, my one, my big idol, my big issue, right? I, I'm a control freak. You might not know it, but I am a control freak. Even if I don't look, uh, even if I, even if it seems like PT doesn't look like he knows what he's doing, majority of the time, I know what I'm doing because I can see it. But oftentimes, once in a while, God throws me something. He throws into our community. He throws us, and it was confirmed by our community. He throws us something that says, this is where I want you to go. And whenever he does that, the first thing that comes to my mind is like, God, I cannot see where this will lead. I cannot see how this will happen. And to be real with you guys, whenever that happens, the first thing that comes to my mind is I'm just going to ignore it, right? I'm going to ignore it until I can see it. But it's, it's been going, the, 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 the vision, the, the, the request, the thing has been going on in my heart over and over. And he says, you got to not worry. Let it go. Trust. This is the year I want you to elevate TLC's game, right? This is the year I want, our ch- I want this church to change the trajectory of the things around it. And this is the year, guys, listen, this is the year that I truly believe, if it's true for the church, it's true for you, that this is the year that God would want you to be game changers. I mean that. To be people who actually raise the stakes of everyone else around them. To be people who actually changes the trajectory of everything else around them. Every generation, listen to me, every generation tries to change the stakes. Every generation tries to change what's going on. We got the boomers, we got the Xers, we got the Ysers, and we got the, G, the, the, the generation Zers, right? We got all these generations trying to change the game. But every generation never fully fulfills it. You know why? Because it keeps changing. It keeps, it keeps they, they say, okay, this is the way to do it. This is the way to make it, make to return the world back to Eden. This is the way to return the world back to the beauty it's supposed to have. Boomers tried it, didn't work out. Xers tried it, didn't work out. Ys tried it, millennials definitely didn't work out. Zs tried it, right? Right, they're, they're trying it now. But all the while, all the while, God in his silent ways is in the background saying, this is the elevation. Would you not be tossed back and forth by the tremble? Would you elevate your game? Would you have a vision for your life so that this generation, you will bring more to my kingdom than before? Every generation, even though they are changing in the foreground, but in the background, God is working, building his kingdom. As you guys realize that, God's kingdom has been built for generations. It has never stopped. But trends, fads come and go constantly. So this year, listen, guys. 
The prayer is that we would have a vision for TLC that would change the game. But this year, this message, I pray, will give you a vision as well to change the game in your life, to have a vision for your life. The key is this. The question that comes up is, hey, okay, we get it. You you you, You are calling us into this place, trying to elevate the game. What's the process? Every, every... Journey has to have a process, has a roadmap. How do we change the game? What do we need to do? Right? How do we elevate? How do we change the stakes? How do we change the trajectory of those around us? And we're gonna look into the book of James, the letters of James, right, to teach us this. Okay? And the reason why we're looking at the book of James, the letter of James, is simply because of this. This is a church after they have met the Lord, they have done their thing, they're being spread out into the world. And you would think that now this church is gonna do something amazing but they're caught up in their own cycle of issues. They're caught up in their own cycle of problems. And James hears about this. He says, let me give you a process. Let me remind you of where you're supposed to go as a church. Let me remind you the bigger vision that God has for your life. Let me remind you that God says, I will use you to change the world. But you ain't going to change the world if you're going to keep bickering in your church with these problems. So let me show you the roadmap. So we're going to look at the book of James for the next few weeks. And we're going to see how to change the process, how to change the game. We're going to see how to be game changers, right? To get rid of these issues, that these these minuscule problems that we have in the church and actually step it up and become game changers. You guys follow me? All right, so open your Bibles. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Let me give you some background on this. Okay, James is the half-brother of Jesus, okay? James did not believe while Jesus was alive that Jesus was the Lord and Savior. I mean, who would believe that your older brother, if he comes to you and says, I am the Savior of the world, right? Can you imagine your older brother telling you that? You'd be like, no, you're not, (laughs) right? I know you. But after Jesus died and he resurrected, James declared Jesus here in verse 1 as Lord Jesus Christ. Declares him as Lord, Okay? And James writes this letter because he was, the, he was the preacher, he was the pastor, he was the shepherd of the church in Jerusalem. And he was, he was shepherding thousands of people until the day when Stephen or Stephen got martyred. That was the day where the whole entire Israel decided to go against the, Jewish, or the Christian community and stone Stephen and they persecute all Christians. So all Christian Jews spread out across the known world. Okay, so check out verse 1. It says this, James, a servant of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Okay, so here they are. Here's our Christian Jews scattered among the nations, this country, that country, that country, and they're having problems. They're gathering in these tiny little hubs, little churches, and they're having problems because the Roman people, anyone who's not a Jew don't like Jewish people, so they're persecuted that way. These Jewish Christians try to kind of meander up to other, their Jewish brethren, but the Jewish brethren are like, we don't like you either because you're Christians. So they're having trouble. They're having trouble finding work, they're having trouble, like, uh, in, in, in the marketplace, the wives are having trouble finding, like, uh, groceries because they're like, hey, you know what? Don't give them the rest. That's the Jewish Christian, right? Their kids are growing up being made fun of. You're the Jewish Christian. They're having trouble, and they're facing persecution. They're facing problems, and they're, they're just bickering, and the, and the church is actually um, struggling. And so James writes them this letter. He writes them this letter to remind them, hey, you lost picture, <laughs> You lost vision. You lost what you're supposed to be. I have called you. God has called you to change the world. And you're worried about something so minuscule, something so foolish. Let me remind you again. Let me remind you where you're supposed to go. Let me remind you the process, the journey, because you were supposed to change the world. You're supposed to restore Eden. You're supposed to bring God's kingdom here. You're supposed to live with destiny and purpose. You're supposed to restore beauty. You're supposed to show the world good really can exist. You're supposed to show the world value. There is value. So he writes them this. Look at verse 2. Okay. What's the process? What's the process? So before we know the process, we got to know where we're going, okay? We got to know what the end destination is. Look, look at verse 2 to verse 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. What is the end goal of this uh, process? Verse 4, it says mature. Everybody say mature. And complete. Everybody say complete. I'll say it like you mean it. Say complete. 
not lacking anything. Say not lacking anything. All right, so here it is. James is saying you got to go through the process because the end goal is maturity. The end goal is completeness. The end goal is that you will not lack anything. Okay? If you want to be a game changer, if you want to be a game changer in your relationship, your family, your personal life, in your career, you got to realize where you're supposed to be going is maturity, completeness, not lacking anything. What's the characteristic of that? Let me show you. What is the characteristic of a person who's mature, complete, not lacking anything? If someone who's mature is not easily swayed. They're not tossed back and forth. They don't need Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat to tell them what's the new trend to go with. They're not easily swayed by the approval of men and women. They're not, they're not, they're not seeking, look, they're not, they're not easily offended. They're not, they're not seeking for success and power in such a way where you're offended if you don't get there. Right? They're not seeking for approval, so if you don't get approval and affirmation, you feel rejected. See, a mature, complete, not lacking person who's going to be a game changer is someone who is not easily moved. You're complete because you don't need the approval of men. You're complete. You're, 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 you're not lacking anything because you don't need a generation that constantly changes telling you what you need to do. You are solid. You are firm. You're flat-footed. You stake your claim. You know your position. In other words, you know your identity. A mature, complete, not lacking person who will be a game changer is someone who knows their identity. You know who you are in Christ. You're not someone always running for power, seeking for success because you're thinking that success is going to give you value. You're not someone that's going to always worry about what to do. You try to control every situation because everything's already taken care of. You know that. You're not seeking for the approval in a relationship or the love of a person because you have the greatest. You are a person that is solid. No one is dictating your journey. You've come to a place where you are not offended by the small stuff. You don't sweat the small stuff. You're not worried about the small stuff. You're not anxious. You're mature. You're complete. Can I share with you guys? Can I share with you guys what a, what a relationship that's mature? Or actually, let's just start here. Let, can I share with you? Can I start with Can I share with you? I have so many examples, okay? Can I share with you with a relationship that's mature? that's actually going to change the world looks like? Can I share with that with you guys? A relationship that is mature, complete, not lacking in anything. It's a relationship where you're not, can you have a vision for 2019 where you will get with somebody or be in a relationship that you're not taking from them? That you're not in it because they're, you're trying to receive something from them because you want to be, I just want to feel loved. I just want someone I can snuggle with, someone that's going to be there when I wake up in the morning. Right? A mature, complete relationship. I don't need this person to validate my existence. A complete, mature, not lacking relationship, a, ch- a relationship that's going to change the world is one that says, I see your glory, and I will do everything I can to get you there. I see the person that God has made you to be, and I will do everything I can to bring you there. Do you see what? The, that's, how, that's how God works in you. The God says, I see you. And I will do everything to get you there. And what was everything he did? He gave his life for that. Can you imagine a couple or a person who realized that for each other? Who's who's giving that to each other rather than taking it? But PT, like, I want to be with them because they make me feel good. Great. You feel good, right? And you're going to be there forever. What happens if they they don't make you feel good anymore? What happens in the time, like, they start annoying you? See, a mature, complete, not lacking relationship is a relationship where you look at this person, where you have the maturity in yourself because you don't need personal approval. You don't need a sense of, uh, you need to fulfill my expectations of what I think you should be. I already know where you need to go. Let me help you get you there. If it takes a long time, that's okay. I'll I'll, I'll walk with you. If it's short, praise the Lord. But if it's long, I will be patient. Would you, would, you, would you dream that? Would you dare dream that for your boyfriend or your girlfriend, right? Would you, would you dare dream that that's possible, that you deserve that, that that's somewhere that God wants you to be in a relationship like that? Not a relationship which says, well, you know, like, well, I don't feel like it today. It's all about me. 
right? A relationship like where you have to beg this person, where you have to like wonder and hope that they're going to show up for you. Can I show you what a relationship, well, can I share with you what a mature man of God looks like, right? Can I share with you that? I mean, uh, part of me, when, I w- when we went to Urbana, when we went to Urbana, I met up with the, the church, uh, RP, right? You all from RP? RP, right? Right? Met up with church and RP, and they brought all their brothers, right? And then, you know, Pastor Bowman looked at me and said, oh, man, you, you guys brought all your sisters. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's kind of <laughs> awkward, right? And he, said <laughs> and he said, what happened? I'm like, what, what do you mean? I got nine girls with me. That's pretty cool, right? He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. But what's all the brothers? So let's not talk about it. <laughs> it breaks my heart, right? Let's not talk about it. To a vision of maturity, not the fact that you were inconvenienced, that it, it was to go out of your norm to step into this. They're like, you know what? I don't, I'm an introvert. I can't deal with so many people. I don't want to go there, right? Do you realize what it means to be a man of God? Do you realize what God's vision for a mature, complete, not lacking brother looks like? It's the fact that wherever you step, you flourish that place. Do you guys realize that? Wherever you step, you're supposed to flourish that place. God's called you for that. That when you step into your family, your family should be, thank goodness I have a son. Praise God I have this son in my life. When you walk into her, your work and your job, they should be like, thank goodness you're here. I cannot stand the last guy, right? This right here, this ship is going to be great because you're here. You flourish that spot. When you walk into your family, your wife be like, I feel complete. I'm flourishing. Our family's flourishing because my husband is there. You're supposed to flourish every time or everywhere you step into. It shouldn't be this. Hey, is so-and-so going to show up? 50-50, man. I don't know, bro. <laughs> like, coin toss who knows right is, are, are they gonna make are they make it happen i don't know i don't know right do you know why that happens because a mature complete not lacking brother is a game changer it's a game changer because you got pictures of what it means to be a man here, right? You got a picture of all the Instagrams, all the selfies, all what it looks like. To, you got to shave this way. You got to dress this way. You got to eat this thing. You got to look this way. What it means to be a game to, what it, be, what it means to be a man in this society, in this generation, because they're thinking if you look like this, if you do this, you're going to change society. But the reality, God is saying a man that's going to be a game changer, a man that's going to complete, be feel complete, that's going to, uh, is mature, complete, and not lacking anything, is a man that flourishes everywhere he goes. Not flourish himself. He, he flourished the situation. You step in there and they're like, yes, so-and-so is here. Your church should be like, oh, my goodness, like, where are all my brothers at? It shouldn't be like that, right? They're like, there's no brothers around anymore. I can't marry any guys in our church. Can't be seen the guys at our church, right? I hear that all the time. It's so annoying, right? Probably true, but so annoying, right? But the reality is why? It's because our brothers, you brothers, right? You don't flourish where you stand. You come and you take. You come and you you're like, I don't know if I should do that. I don't want to. Oh man. You take. Right? Sisters, you know what it looks like to be a sister that's gonna k- change the world? A sister that's actually complete, mature, not lacking anything, a sister who has her identity in place. You know what a sister looks like that? A woman of God? You know what that looks like? A woman of God guys, is a woman who uses her words to elevate, who uses the things that she, think about this, you brothers, you know, a compliment from a brother was like, yeah, what's, what's cool, a compliment from a sister is like, yes, right, something about the way a sister speaks, I don't know, something, it's like magical tone, whatever that comes out, but it can elevate, but it can also do what, cut you down pretty hard, doesn't it, Right? And yet, a majority of our times, our sisters and our ladies, you use your words to criticize, to be critical, instead of elevating and strengthening. A lot of times, do you guys realize that your prayer, I mean, I, your prayers, your tears, has the power to move mountains? You, y- your prayers and your tears, when God hears you pray in anguish, He says, that is the heart of someone who understands. I will move mountains for her. And yet you use your tears to manipulate, to get your way. Because you're thinking, this is, how I'm suppo- this is what I'm supposed to want. This is, what, uh, this is what I'm supposed to get. This is, I'm in this generation, so I'm supposed to do this and that, and so I can't get it, so I'm going to cry about it. You play victim. You use your tears. Not knowing that your words, your words can move nations. Your tears, right, can move mountains. That's a game changer. 
A woman who can do that. A woman who is mature, complete, not lacking in anything. That's going to change the trajectory of everyone else around her. That's going to elevate the people around her. Do you know what it looks like to be a family? That's mature, complete, not lacking in anything. A family that has a vision to be a game-changing family. You know what it looks like to be a family like that? It's not a family with two white picket fences and nice house and backyard and everything looks nice and easy and comfortable. A family with sons and daughters, moms and dads, a family that is going to change, that's going to move, that's going to be mature. It's a family that says this, I'm not going to fall into the trap of what everyone thinks I should, how I should raise my kid or how I should look as a, uh, how my husband should look or how my wife, uh, I'm not going to fall into that trap, but I'm going to ask the question, what is it that we're going to do for God's kingdom? A family that says, I'm not going to, I'm not going to just, just, Take my kids to soccer practice and do this and do that and kind of give you the little, you know, white picket fence kind of deal, soccer mom kind of deal. But I'm going to ask the question, what does it take for my family to move God's kingdom? What do I need? Maybe I have to lower the expectation. Maybe not four-bedroom house. Maybe I, maybe I has to lower the expectation. A family that is mature, because you're not worried about what people think of you, right? If you know your identity. You're not worried about what, how much you feel complete or not lacking, right? If you know who has you, your focus is not upon trying to create some sort of image that's based upon this changing group of generations. Your focus is creating a family that's mature, complete, not that that's going to change the world, change the trajectory of the people around them. God has called you that. When a family can do that, it changes neighborhoods, it changes workers, it changes friends, it changes everyone. When a relationship can do that, people say that's relationship goals. Not like, you know, Paris or whatever, but that right there. Consistency, commitment, wanting the best for the other person, that's relationship goals. When a man is willing to step into a situation, even though it's out of his will, out of his desire, out of his want, uncomfortable, but willing to step into it because he knows that he's going to flourish the situation, that's going to change stuff. When a woman's willing to use her words not to break down somebody but to elevate them, that's going to change things around them. You guys follow me? There's one more, right? Career, right? Career. Oh, how many of y'all think about your career? You're, like, you're thinking, oh, I want my career to be a six-figure salary. I want, I want this to look great. I want, I want all these things to come together. Can I tell you something? A career, when you start thinking about a career, that's going to be a game-changing career. A game-changing, mature, not lacking, complete career is a career where you have purpose and destiny. You can have, you don't need six figures for purpose and destinies. You don't need a 401k. I mean, it's nice to have. I'm not saying, I'm saying it's bad, but you don't need it for purpose and destiny, right? You can be the most simple yet the most satisfied. But we think of careers like, oh, we got to have all these things put together for my career to actually look good. A career that's going to change the thing as a career where you're willing to step into and say, this gives me passion. Can I, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a real story, okay? Well, when I was in Peru, all we did for the last time we were there, we just built houses. We just, I, I w- my body was burnt, right? I mean, like, <laughs> you ever, I was big, and so when it gets burnt, it's even nastier, right? The tank top, it was, it was just bad. But you know what I, what I thought of at the end of the day when I was putting on that, that last nail for the roof? I was I can do this forever. I can spend my whole life just doing this. I, there, I didn't need the approval of everyone telling me, you need to have a six-figure, you need to have life insurance, health insurance, you got to do all this stuff. I didn't have people telling me, this is where you need to be, this is what you need to do. This what you didn't have any of it because right there at that moment was purpose. Right there at that moment was destiny. Right there at that moment, the very thing that I placed my hand upon doing, I knew it brought something else. Purpose. Purpose is not found in the money, you guys. Destiny is not found in that. You can, you can, if you have it, great. But I'm telling you, majority of the time people who search for that, run for that, they always want more. I, let me tell you the story. There's a, there's a sister of, of mine that I used to, um, that I used to m- mentor or uh, used to be in my church when she was young, right? I didn't think she was going to make anywhere in life, but she actually did, okay? And she, <laughs> she, she, she got a six-figure job, a graphic designer up in San Francisco. Man, great. Great new pad. Her house is 
fantastic. She had, she had this boyfriend that she's like, I love my boyfriend. She see her traveling all the time. And I remember the last time she was down here, we had this gathered together. And she looked at me and she said, PT, I'm not happy. I said, what do you mean you're not happy? If I knew graphic design made that much, I was gone to graphic design, right? Like, what do you mean you're not happy, right? She's like, yeah, I have, I have the nice pad. I got the job I want. I got the dream job. I got the guy. I'm traveling, but I'm not happy because I feel like it's not purposeful. And I told her, what's this? She, she asked, what's wrong with me? I was like, well, it's many things, but <laughs> can I tell you what's really wrong? Can I tell you what's going on? You forgot your identity. You don't have an identity. You don't have, the reason why you're constantly thinking all this, because you're, this is what this generation is telling you, this is what you're supposed to have. This is what you're supposed to be. This is who you're supposed to be with. And you're tossing, you're turning, you're being pushed back and forth. You don't have an identity to stand strong in. So you're, you're constantly trying to find validation and approval in everywhere, in your work, in your relationships, in your salary. You try to find validation in all those things, and you're not getting validated because it's never enough. You're not complete. You're lacking always. You don't have purpose. You don't have destiny. God has called each and every one of his sons and daughters for purpose, guys. He has called each and every single one of you guys for destiny. He has called you to take a generation that is broken, that's doing their best. I'm not saying this generation is bad, but they're doing their best to redeem Eden and actually redeem Eden. He's asking us to say, would you actually step into it and redeem Eden? Would you trust this process? How am I supposed to do that, PT? I get it. I'm supposed to be mature, not lacking anything, complete. But how am I supposed to do that? What's the process, right? What's the process? How am I supposed to get there? It's great to know that's, you know, that's really nice to have. I, w- I want that. How do I get there? All right, check it out. Two things. That's the longest part of my sermon, I promise. No, I don't, no, I lied. Here. <laughs> Next one's going to be just as crazy. Verse 2, go back to verse 2. So here it is. This is church. They are persecuted. They're just trying to survive. They're going with the flow of their, uh, of their surroundings right now. Their surroundings tell them, we hate you. We're persecuting you. You can't get anything. The Jewish community says, get out of here. We don't want you here. They're, s- they're in a bad, tight spot, and they're thinking, oh, we just need to survive. I need to go with the flow, go with the compromise. I need to just do what they're telling me to do if I want to move forward in life. And James is writing them a question. He's saying this, look at the process. Your goal is to be mature, not lacking anything, complete. But here's the process. Verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. What's the process? What's the process? Paul, uh, P- James is saying this. Stick to the unchanging excellence. The only reason why you face trials, everybody say trials. Right? The only reason you face trial is because you are living in a standard of excellence, and there's a different standard trying to come into that standard and mess with it. And so whenever, and this standard, is, if it's like really comprehensive and everyone's following it, it comes in. You're facing trial. You're like, I want to stick to this, but this is so alluring. I want to stick to this because it's excellent. That's at least what God's telling me. But this is so, it's so drawing. It seems so easy, simpler. And so you face trials. See, God's saying there's a parameter. There's a standard of excellence if you would just walk it. If you would walk it, you will get to maturity. There's a standard of excellence. If you would trust in it, you will get to a place where you will understand that you lack nothing. There's a standard of excellence. If you would step into it and you would just trust in the process, you will go to it and you will be complete. But you got to stick to the standard of excellence. And I know a lot of you are like, well, that's it. Uh, there you go, PT. Christianity, all them rules, all you, you use cute words like excellence and standards to make it sound like pretty, but reality, all is just rules. It's just rules this and rules that. No, it's not. They're parameters. They're, 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 they're boundaries to keep you in a place moving in the right direction. Let me ask you this question. I've shared this illustration so many times, but it's good, right? Imagine you're a fish, and that fish is in the water, and it's like, yeah, I'm a fish. I love this place, right? But I don't want to be here anymore. I just want to be free. I want to do my own thing. And that fish decided to jump out of the water and lands on the land. I got to do, I did whatever I wanted. I'm not strict, I'm not, I'm not held down by rules. What's going to happen to that fish? It's going to die, right? Because the water is where it thrived. The water is where it lived. The water is where it survived. The water is where it became better. 
the water, the, the bigger the water, the bigger the fish, right? B the bigger, it's more, you know, you guys know what I'm talking about. But anyways, <laughs> right? So here it is, the standard of excellence. When you get into a relationship, this is what happens, oh man, this is what happens. Isn't it? You should have standards before you get into a relationship, amen? Right? You should have some standards before you get into a relationship, not, not make up the standards when you're in the relationship. You guys get me? Like, like, but PT, like, I know this is what God's telling me to do, but, like, I, I feel like he's going to leave me if I don't. Then leave him, right? Leave, le leave him or leave her, however you guys want. Because that's not, that's not for you. If this is God's, this is the standard that's going to thrive and flourish you, and you're making up your own standards, you're going a whole different trajectory. You're going a whole different way. You're being tossed and turned. You're doing your, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to hate you on you guys, because you're, you're doing your best to re redeem and restore Eden. You're doing your best to make this world a better place, and you're thinking by doing this because the cultural fad is this, the cultural trend is this, this is how everyone else is doing it. If I go into it, I, I'll be happy too. But reality, God is saying every generation is trying to figure out how to do a relationship. Why don't you ask the one who actually made relationships? Would you have standards before you get into a relationship? You see, the enemy, listen guys, the enemy, the enemy is not, the enemy is happy, okay? It's, he's happy when you are, he doesn't care when you are tossing, doing your own thing. He's like, that's great. <laughs> that's great. I'm glad they're doing that. Right? They're just going to be tossed back and forth forever. They're going to be going this direction, that direction. They're going to figure it out themselves. Right? Rendered useless. You're not going to change anything. You're just going with the flow. But the enemy gets upset when some people begin to say, you know what, I have standards. I want to set my foot down. There's an actual standard like PT, but ticks forever. I can't find him or her. Stand, I, I feel like my standards are so high. Would you have the patience to wait? You think God made the world and he can't find you a boyfriend? <laughs> you think you think he, he he called stars into existence and like you can't find a wife? Is that is that really that difficult? There's like billions of people in this world and there's no one in here for you that God hasn't prepared for you, right? Because you have no standards. But when God's people are willing to step their foot down, and say I have standards. That's when it gets scary. That's when it gets freaky because enemies like you know what? Dang, they're gonna do something. That relationship is going to mean something. That's going to impact somebody. That's going to change other people. That's going to change that whole group that they hang out with. That's going to change that, that brother and that sister that hangs out with them. That's going to change their family. If you would have standards. Right? See? And he doesn't care. Because this is what he does. If, he, if, you are true, if you are a child of God, the only play he has left the only play he has left, because he can't win your soul anymore, the only play he has left is to render you useless. That's the, only play, that's the only play he has left. And the way he renders you useless is to get you to forget about the standards. To forget about the, the standard of excellence that God has for you. Right? And now, I, kn I know what you guys think. He's like, well, PT, like, to follow, I don't see any benefits out of it. It seems so archaic. Seems so um, old school. I don't see any benefits from that. So because I don't see any benefits of it, there must not be any. So I'll do my own thing. Right? I yelled at your parents the other day, or yesterday, or last week. I didn't yell. I just kind of verbally assaulted. I don't know what. Right? <laughs> what, what, I said, what I said was this. I said, I, said, I said it like this. I said, hey, look. You know, I asked them a question. But I said, hey, parents. They're like, yes. Like, don't you don't you have like you know things that you want your kids to do? They're like, yeah. And and don't they always say they don't want to do it? It's like, yeah, they always like, like you know, and don't, doesn't it seem like it's dumb because you know if they would do it, they would actually get better because it's it's you are wiser and you're you've been mature enough, you experienced it, you know what's going on. They say, Yeah, you tell them that. You go back and you tell them that's exactly what we're thinking. And I told them like, that's so funny. That's so funny because you know exactly, even though they cannot see why you're telling them to do what they're doing, you know it's good for them, and yet you do the exact same thing. God here is speaking into your life, telling you, hey, would you do this? And because you can't see the benefit of it, you choose not to. And yet you have the audacity to tell your kids to do the exact same thing that you don't do. Are you wiser than God? 
Are you more mature than God? Do you have more experience than God? I don't think so. You know this at a natural level, and yet you don't step into it. You see, the standard of excellence, guys, in relationship as a man of God, as a woman of God, in family, that standard that God has called us to be, though we cannot see, though we cannot see the benefit of it, does not mean that it's not there. But he's saying the process is what? He says, trust the process. Where I want you to be, I want you to be game changers. I want you to be people that actually can change and elevate the world around you. I want you to be people that actually take the traditional trend that you're living in and show them that, you know, you're doing a great job, you're doing your best at it, but it's not complete. There is one who is working in the background to make it happen. Would you be a game changer? But the only way is what? Would you live in the standard of excellence? Now, I'm not telling you guys messing up is here and there's not, is that your pattern of life is seeking for the pattern of excellence, that you're listening to it, that you're following after it. All right? What else? What's the process? One, stick to the standard of excellence. Second one, right here. You're not going to like this one, but it's, it's there. Verse 3, check it out. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. The testing of your faith develops perseverance. Everyone say embrace the suck. <laughs> there's a Navy SEAL, there's a Navy SEAL uh, model, embrace the suck. Say it again. Embrace the suck, okay? What I mean by that is this. Some of y'all will be like, PT, I, I listened to you. I, st- I kept with the standard of, you know, following after God's excellence. I'm still single after 10 years. Hey, what's up with that? PT, I listen to you. I try to keep the standard of building a family that's focused on God's kingdom, and we still suck. What's up with that? Right, PT, I try to listen to you uh, to be a man of God, to be a woman of God, and nobody's taking me seriously. What's up with that? Embrace the suck. PT, I'm listening to you to, uh, to find a, 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 uh, a job that has passion and destiny, and I'm in a job right now that I hate. I'm in a position right now that is not going anywhere. What's up with that? And James says, you got to embrace the suck. You know why? Because it builds perseverance. There's a reason why you're there. You guys get me? There's a reason why God has still kept you single. If you, if you really walked, listen to me, if you really walked in the standard of excellence, there's a reason why God is keeping you single. There's something still you need to learn. There's something still that he's saying, you know, I know you want a, that beautiful, wonderful relationship where you're just giving to each other and glory this and glory that, right? But you're still taking. You're still a selfish brat, right? You think after 10 years you'll learn it, but you haven't. And so, you know, you're, I'm, I'm trying my best to teach it to you. Would you just embrace the suck and learn it? Would you be a person that actually gives rather than take? Would you be someone who actually offers rather than be selfishly drawing and drying and, and, and just making them, just taking from other people. Embrace the suck. PT, you told me that if I was trying to focus my family on building God's kingdom, and now I have a wife or a husband that's just really not around. Hey, first of all, you marry them, okay? You stuck with them. <laughs> God's placed you there. And if it's, a, if it's a month, thank God they change. If it's a year, maybe it's 10 years. But there's something. There's something that you need to learn. Maybe you still have not learned to communicate correctly, and your communicating is still just all nagging. Your communication is still all pointing fingers and blade pushing. Maybe you need to learn something before you actually get to a place where your family can be a blessing and a kingdom-driving family. You still need to learn something. God's placed you there. Maybe God's placed you in this career, this, this dead-end job that you're right now. You, you apply for five jobs, and God, you got this one. You're like, I suck. I hate this job. I thought I was supposed to have a job that's passionate, destiny. I'm not supposed to like be all happy about it. I'm, I'm here. Why? Because maybe you need to learn humility. Maybe you got to learn some humility in your job, right? I mean, how many of y'all graduate and you want to make six figures right away? And you're like, you need to learn actually to be humble about life first. Things don't come easy, right? Stop being so narcissistic that you think you deserve everything. You got to learn some humility here. That's why you're stuck. I want to teach you something. That's why I placed you there. So embrace the suck. Embrace it. But here's the issue, too. Sometimes, here. 
sometimes because we forego the standard of excellence. Because the standard of excellence, no matter if you, if you stick to it, if you trust in that, you know what happens? God naturally drives you to wherever place he needs you to be because you're trusting. So he drives you to a position, and you're like, I hate this, but I'm, that means I must grow here. But oftentimes, when you forego that, when you forego the standard of excellence, you place yourself in somewhere. You place yourself in a relationship that's horrible. You're like, oh, God, where are you now? Why aren't you here for me? So-and-so is such a, they just cheated on me. Hey, hey, you set the standards. You forgo excellence. Hey, God, what's going on with my career? Like, I, I did my best. You didn't listen to me when I asked you. You just took it on your own strength to do this. And so you chose it yourself. You forgo the standard of excellence and you decided to cheat your way into your career. Now you're here. Sometimes you place yourself in that position. You guys realize that? And when you find yourself in that, the first thing you should go back and ask yourself is, have I really stuck with the standard of excellence? If I'm not, maybe I need to let go of whatever I'm doing now and go back to that and let God direct me to the place I need to be. What's the process, PT? Trust the process. If maturity, if the vision, honestly, I, I pray that you guys will have a vision to be people that will change and elevate things around you. What's the process? Maturity, completeness, not lacking in anything. What's the process? Stick to the standard of excellence. Two, embrace the suck, because it's going to suck for a while, right? But you know this. You know this. You know this naturally. You don't have to be a theologian to know this. You know this naturally in your life. You know how I know you know this? I mean, those of you guys who actually go to the gym, right? You know this. The first day you decide, you know, first of the year, I'm going to go back to the gym. I'm going to start working out. What happens when you start working out and start lifting more than you can handle? What happens the next day? Right? You, I can't touch my nose. <laughs> I can't scratch my back. I can't wipe my back. I can't do anything. Right? I can't. I'm, I, I, it just hurts all over. And you're in pain. You're like, I don't see anything happening, so it must not be really good for me. I'm going to just stop. Right? I'm just gonna I'm just gonna give up on it, right? Cause like I thought if I do this I'm gonna get healthier. I don't feel healthy. I feel like I can't get out of bed. That can't be healthy, right? But you know, when you embrace the suck though, eventually you do get healthy, <laughs> right? Eventually you do gain muscle mass. <laughs> eventually you will be able to lift that thing that you tried to lift but you couldn't, right? But it takes what? Your willingness to embrace it. Embrace the suck. Those of you guys in college, if you're in college, you have to realize, who, who's the one that ultimately accepts and denies? It's not the people who, it's God. God works in, in any possible way. And you're thinking, I don't, I wanted to go to Berkeley, but I ended up in UC, oh no, not UC, was right. that's awesome. I ended up in La Cal State Long Beach, right? I'm like, oh man, that sucks, you know? What's going on with my life right now? Right? Can I tell you something? <laughs> I'm just joking. I love Cal State Long Beach, right? <laughs> <laughs> Right? Huh. God's placed you there. God's placed you there. Can I tell you that? Can I tell you something? If you're, if you're trying to be a man or woman of God and uh, you have that weird quirk that no one listens to, right? You have that weird quirk that just, just gets people like, I don't want to deal with them, right? You're like, I want to be a man of God, but it seems like no one really is, is embracing me. Like, just that, the weirdness that you have. Can I tell you? Trust in the weirdness, okay? God's going to use that weirdness. Maybe not in this crowd, but he's going to use that weirdness for somewhere else. But if you would trust in that, would you embrace that suck and say, like, yeah, people think I'm odd and I don't think I can do anything with this, but, you know, it's okay. I'm just going to stick with it. God made me this way. You stick to that. You know what's going to happen? You will. You embrace that. You will grow into it. God will take that and he will turn you into a man, a woman of maturity, not lacking anything. Because the moment you let someone else tell you how to be a man of God, the moment you let someone else tell you how to be a woman of God, the moment you let someone else besides the standard of excellence tell you what to do, that's the moment you start swaying back and forth, toss back and forth. You guys get me? 2019, TLC, would you be people of vision? 2019, would you trust the process that God wants to use you to change the world? I know, I know that sounds very like, like, woo, like, that's, is that even possible? Okay, maybe not change the world, maybe change your surroundings first. We'll talk about the world later, okay? But 2019, God is using you to change the game. But you got to trust the process. And here's the last thing, here's the last thing. What happens? Okay, PT, I did it. I, 
I, I stood to the standard of excellence. PT, I did it, right? I embraced the suck, but I'm just tired. I don't know if I can do it tomorrow. I don't know if I can get up tomorrow and do this again. It's just too much work. I'm just facing an uphill battle. And when that moment comes, when that, when that, when that lie begins to infest your brain and, you, and, you ha- and you're on that, the precipice of just giving up, this is what James says. You guys follow me? Embrace who? Take a guess. Embrace who? Check it out right here. When all hope is lost and you have nothing left, check it out, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does, constantly tossed around. What is James saying here? What is the wisdom he's asking you to ask for? Is it just like, give me wisdom to know what to do? No. He says, give me the wisdom to trust simply, solely, based on what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. Give me the wisdom to see the cross and realize that if my God will go that far for me, even when I was an enemy, will he really let me stay in the suck for that long? Will he really keep me here and keep me single, keep me in a place of pain and hurt for that long? If he's willing to go that far for me, do you not think he will see it to completion? Give me the wisdom to see my God moving mountains for me. Give me the wisdom to see my God moving and desiring to give everything he has so that I will know that he is for me. Give me the wisdom to see Jesus Christ on the cross laying down his very life, taking his very last breath to have me. Give me the wisdom to see Christ, to know that if he will go that far, then he's not going to leave me here. And though I cannot see the good, though I cannot see the benefit of what's going to happen, me sticking to the standards of excellence, me trying to keep on embracing the suck, I know that's where I'm supposed to be. That's what people keep telling me I'm supposed to go. I don't know when I'm going to get there. I don't know how I'm growing into that. But when it gets difficult, when it gets hard, teach me to see you. Teach me to see you so that I will take a step into it. That's what the problem with the church was. They lost the vision of that. They lost the vision of their God, of their Savior, of their Lord. And so they began to bicker among each other. They began to try to find ways to up one another. They began to try and ways, find ways to hate each other. They fi- find ways to, to make one, the other people feel smaller than the other. Using words in their tongues to, to hurt one another. They forgot the vision of their cross. And James says, if any of you lack wisdom, Ask for it. But when you ask, he says what? You got to you gotta trust. Because if you say, oh, yeah, give me, I see Jesus on the cross. I get it. But my feelings and what I'm going through is just too much. Forget it. I'm done. He says what? You're being tossed back and forth. You're being tossed here and there. Something else is defining your life. Something else is adding value to your life. Something else is telling you how to live. Can I share with you the vision of TLC? All right, I'll tell you the vision. This happened around December, actually October, November, December, right, during that time, right, because I, I ignored it so many times, right? God, God, was, God was coming, and he, and he was just speaking through a bunch of our leaders. I remember back then, you know, usually when we first started, when we first did this together at TLC, I, I did most of the, this is what we got to do, guys, this is what we got to do. This time, like, people were coming to me, like, tell me, this is what we got to do. This, God was using people to confirm what he was saying to me, and I was just ignoring them, right, because I was like, I don't want to do it, right? And he was saying something very simple. And I, you guys were like, that's it? I mean, isn't we've been doing that? That sounds kind of weird. But it's, it's so true. This is what he's saying. He's saying, vision of TLC, 2019. Would you be a church that actually loves people? I was like, what? <laughs> I love people. I love people a lot, PT. I mean, God, right? I love people a lot, God, right? You know, God, I love, have you not seen the guys I saw? I love people, right? I am, <laughs> I am a saint, Lord, right? And he said, but hmm. You know what he said, but hey, but you love your own kind of people. You love the people that you think you can shape and mold. Hey, what about that dude that you saw at the party, you know, the Hispanic brother? You didn't talk to him. I said, yeah, but we're at a party. Come on, like, you know, it's kind of awkward conversation started. Hey, 
What about that homeless person you walked past three times? I had no change the first two times, right? You couldn't pray for them? What about that social justice warrior kid that you deal with in school all the time? I said, Lord, that's a whole different story. Let's not go there, right? You only love your kind. You only reach out to those you think you want to reach out to. You don't really love people. I was really offended by that. I was like, Lord, no, I do love people. You don't know what you're talking about, right? And then what happens? So what, God, what does God do? God, God sends people like Tony this year, man. We got to evangelize the people. We got to evangelize. Just go out there and just speak the truth to anyone we see. I'm like, shut up, right? So we, we, we got people coming to me and telling me, like, hey, PT, man, we, we, got, we got outreach. We got, we got to reach people. I'm like, shut up, shut up, shut up, right? And I go to Havana. I'm, I'm just <laughs> go to Havana. Oh, Lord, I go to Havana. And I'm just looking at all these people, and they're, they're as different as different can get, okay? I'm like, everything that I am, I feel like they are the very contrast of that, right? Everything, every way in which I deal with my spirituality and my Christianity, I feel like they dealt with it the opposite way. And I'm like, what is going on, right? They got, like, art going. They got, like, things happening. I'm like, Lord, I don't know what to do, right? <laughs> I don't know how to take this. And God says, because you don't know how to love them. And I was like, dang, you right. You right. Vision of TLC 2019, guys, listen. We're going to change the culture of our church, right? We got we to we really change the culture of our church to be a church that's not homogenous, but a church that's willing to see people and love people wherever and whatever they are. Doesn't matter what, cu- what, what race, what culture, doesn't matter what background, what gender, doesn't matter where they are, but we are willing to step into that place and love them. Not afraid of being tossed back and forth because we're mature, hopefully, right? Not being afraid to... Uh, worry about the approval of others because hopefully we already have the approval of our, of our God. We have <sighs> our completeness to go and actually be game changers, to meet people, to engage with people, to love upon people, to be the church that God has called us to be. You guys following me? Right? My prayer, guys, TLC 2019, would you individually first <laughs> seek God's vision of maturity in your life? Would you seek that vision of maturity in your life? For your careers, for your relationship, for your personal life, for your family life, would you seek God's vision of maturity, of completeness, of lacking nothing, a life that actually can change the course of those around you? Would you seek that? And would you come and build this church? Come and build our community into a community that cares and loves everyone around them. And we say that so flippantly, but it's we, we got to actually do it. We, we, we talk about loving people, but you know we only love a certain type of people. But we would have the audacity and the courage to say, if this is the standard of excellence, then let me embrace the suck, right? And let's do it, okay? Let 2019 be a year where we go beyond our security, beyond what's comfortable, beyond what's easy, embrace the suck. Okay, let's pray.